Well, I'm delighted to be joined this morning by Rachel, our first violinist, Rachel Harris, who's joining us from Hamburg. I'm in Norfolk at the moment, Rachel's in Hamburg. And we wanted to have a chat about Bach sonatas and partitas and suites and really explore what these pieces are. They're core um, a staple of our repertoire for solo violin and solo cello and, and it's just um, a good idea to have a, a discussion and explore them a little bit further. So over to you Rachel. Well um, uh, my first question is, is quite a basic one. What is a suite? What is a suite? Okay, because um, of course the violin repertoire is not not so called suites are they? They're violin sonatas and partitas. Yeah. But cello repertoire is a suite. So a suite is basically a collection of, of dance movements in this case. Um, Bach um, starts each cello suite with a prelude and ends it with a gigue. And then there are a series of old fashioned dances in between. So you then have an allemand, a courant, and a sarabande. And after the sarabande comes a pair of newer, more fashionable dances from the 18th century, such as uh, minuets, bourrées, or gavottes. So that, in in terms of Bach cello suites, is a suite. Wow! Yeah, that, I didn't. I didn't actually know that. I know about the old four style um, movements with the allemand starting and the courant, then the sarabande, then the gigue, because um, Bach uses that in his first um, partita. Um, suite, I believe, means um, just movements that follow on from each other. Yes, and, I think, yeah. yeah, and and partita is 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 uh, I think it's it's separated move separated movements in parts, as it were. So the sonatas are more of the normal uh, sonata da chiesa, church-like sonatas, where it's a slow movement, a fast movement, a slow movement, a fast movement. And with Bach and these solo violin pieces, it's it's the second movement's always a fugue. And in the partitas, he does either the old-fashioned sort of dances, or he has a, a, a modern idea, innovative idea with lots of doubles. There's uh, variations with different tempi, and, and then or or a, a, just a, a French style type of um, follow-on of movements. But um, how, we've got um, six. We've got three sonatas and three partitas, and how many cello? Suites, have you got? Well, we've got six as well, actually. Um, just to suites, and I, I wanted it. It was interesting what you said about the partitas and sonatas, the sonatas being the, the four movement da chiesa church format. The suites, I think, probably what distinguishes them because I'm imagining the sonatas don't have the same key for every movement, whereas no. mm. the, the suites, um, perhaps they're, they're grouped collectively. Um, they are, so for example, the first suite in G major, every movement is in G major, apart from one of the minuets, which is in the tonic G minor instead. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that follows through. So that, that they, you have a unity of, of, um, of key, of tonality running through the suite. Um, but yes, there are six as well for, for Bach. Yeah, I, um, this thing about keys, um, I think in, he likes to, at least with the um, sonatas, he likes to take a relative major for the for the third movement. Um, so very gentle and intimate feeling for the third movement, even though it might be a dance. So mm. in the first um, G minor sonata, it's called a Siciliana. Um, and I think often suites were, um, they were often uh, first composed as loose movements that were put together. Maybe Bach didn't do that, but there were other composers who would just put together a, a follow on of dances, maybe for dancers um, to, to dance to them. Well, that, <laughs> that, that, the the that tempi was. from, for, there was a different, you can't necessarily dance these dance movements in the violin or the cello suites um, because the tempo's wrong in a way. And there are sources, um, treatises from the time which say uh, there were three different tempi, one for a dance which is to be played by instruments, one it, which is for a dance to be sung, and one for a, a dance which is actually written for dancers. So we as performers then have to find out 
are we going to play it in the instrumental style or do we want to try and pretend we've got dancers there or have we really got dancers there which would actually mm -hmm. be quite interesting i think well i mean plenty of people perform certainly i know performances of the cello suites with dancers so you have to wonder whether or not the tempi are adapted because as you say the tempi aren't necessarily the right ones for dance mm -hmm. in the in the tempi that we perform them as instrumentalists but mm -hmm. um everyone certainly in the 18th century knew the dance steps um that that informs the, the style and the meter and the way you approach each movement which it, i'm not sure that cellists today um have would have the same understanding especially cellists who haven't studied historical or violinist uh, historical performance because part of our training as um period instrument players is that we we often have to study dance mm -hmm. so we have a, a very in my case very basic understanding of some of the steps and the weighting of the steps and, and the importance of the beats, um, mm -hmm. which beats are more important. Um, I, I do like to think, that certainly with the cello suites, that Bach is such an expert craftsman in the way he writes, that even without knowing the steps, the way he's written the music, it, he in, it's all there for you. To, yeah. you know, if you just follow oh, he, the instruction, it's all there. He, he would have definitely known the steps. He would have definitely known, because it's like if we, we recognize something which is part of our culture and so it's integrated in a very very sort of internalized way and so for Bach he he knew what a pas de bourre looked like you know and um he uh, also knew all the chorales so when you get to his more sonata da chiesa his more sonata writing he, you recognize this influence of church music or chorales, and um, especially in the, the big Chacon, which is one of the first pieces he wrote, actually. Um, they have, there has been a, a, a way of dating these. Um, and it has been worked out by um, various uh, uh, musicologists. Helga Turner has done a lot of uh, numerology in it, and worked out the chorales that are going that are underneath underlying his uh, writing and his harmony and his harmonization um which already i get i get goosebumps thinking mm. about that it's quite uh, um yeah so he's on totally many levels he's integrated it all i mean he was the an utmost genius he played the violin he played the violin he learned it possibly before at the same time as the organ but he was, uh, we know he was a genius on the organ, yeah. but he was also a genius on the violin. He must have been a phenomenal violinist. I really believe he wrote that for himself. It is perfectly playable. I was um, going to ask, do you know, do you have any sense of who the sonatas and partitas were written for? Because one thing I love when performing this kind of repertoire is to have an idea of who might have played it. I love to trace that lineage. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just curators, basically. We're one of many th hundreds or thousands of people putting our stamp on it. And I love to know where the line began really mm. and I, I can trace that with the cello uh, suites I think but I don't know about the violin party uh, the, the violins I believe he wrote them for himself um, to be played in Curtin he started uh, writing them a bit earlier before Curtin and um, uh, he had to play a lot of his job was writing instrumental music and being concert master and in curtain um, from the violin. So uh, you could uh, be he had different various different positions. And so he his position was quite a good one in curtain where he had to write music and perform it and lead the orchestra and di uh, direct various things. But in curtain, they had a small, uh, uh, very must have been a very good group of players. He wrote his Brandenburg concertos at that time. Well, and, that's the period I associate with his mm, most free kind of instrumental compositions. Mm, he wasn't tied by any constraints of, of church at that point, was he? No. He was free to compose what he wanted for this amazing band of musicians. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, so his job was obviously not to compose church music. That was his job later. So and his, in his function, he did his job really well. And other in, uh, instrumentalists came and visited, you know, when you were traveling from A to B, you make sure you'd go via a very special point because you knew there was a really great musician and then you go past and say hi i'm so and so and i'd like to get to know you and 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 for example pizendel who was an amazing violinist um traveled past uh um i think it was curtain at that time when uh, and met bach and we he on his way to dresden and he got uh, he must 
I think it's possible that he took um, a copy of Bach's, um, he copied off the Sonatas and Partitas and took it with him to Dresden. We have the title page in Dresden and nothing else. So we really, we only have this one manuscript written in Bach's handwriting, but there was something else in Dresden. And there, interestingly, for the nerds, for the violin nerds under us, um, the order is different. I've actually, I've got the order here because it's, I was fascinated. I'd love to play it in a different order than we know it. So it starts off with the first one, the first part, it starts with a partita in B minor, then okay. comes the sonata in A minor, that's, that's now number one and number two mixed together, then comes the D minor partita, then comes the sonata G minor, then partita A major and sonata C major. So C major is one of the last ones that he wrote. So maybe it's in the right, what, it's sort of a bit of an order that he wrote them in. The B minor is not um, such an early one, but um, I'll write, I'll put that in the description underneath the original order. So uh, you don't have to <laughs> write, write along at this moment. But I think it's, it's fascinating just to think that what we know as being a definitive order was not yeah. necessarily definitive. Was there something like that with the cello suites? Well, I, mean, I, I don't think Bach played the cello either, did he? No, Bach, Bach didn't play the cello. And in fact, the, the closest I can come up with, with, with yes, I don't know. I mean, the cello suites, the earliest, there is no manuscript in Bach's hand. We have the earliest one is in the hand of his second wife, Anna Magdalena Bach, which is, um, I've actually got it here. I'll, I'll just lean down and just show you the front page. Um, here we go. So this is, I don't know, if is it coming out in mirror image? Probably. No, so I can see it fine. You can read it properly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It is very clear. It's beautiful. This is the prelude. I'll hold back a little bit so you can see. I mean, all of these resources are readily available. There's a fantastic edition uh, with the four earliest um, facsimile editions. But um, so we so we don't have an order from Bach, but we have an order from Anna, Anna Magdalena. And I've never heard of a different order than the one that all cellists know today, which starts with BWV 1007, 1007, which is the first suite in G major. So we have G major. D minor, C major, E flat major, C minor, and D major to end. And actually, it's quite interesting thinking about the, uh, there's a big difference between the violin repertoire and the cello repertoire and the kind of instrument you'd approach to perform it because you can't perform the six cello suites on one instrument. <laughs> <laughs> we you have do that with the ones. It's yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, we have a problem with, in that Bach specified, or rather the manuscript in Anna Magdalena's hand specifies scordatura tuning for the fifth suite in C minor. So instead of having our standard tuning of the top string being an A, then a D, and a G, and a C, we have um, the top string tuned to a G, which makes for an amazingly rich, dark tonality and, and sound. It's absolutely wonderful. That you can play on a regular cello, it just affects in a concert, for example, that it's not very stable. You, you wouldn't necessarily tune your A, and a string up mm. and down between an A and G, especially with a gut string, which is even less stable than a metal string. You couldn't do that. So if you were doing the suites all together, you would probably have two instruments. But the real problem comes with the, fifth, with the sixth suite, because that specifies that calls for a five string instrument, a cello piccolo. So Bach writes for an instrument with an E string at the top. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and there are some theories that the, these suites, all of the suites were written for a, a, a cello, a small cello that would have been played on the arm. Ah, yeah. Um, but uh, you can, of course, play the, the, the sixth suite on a, on a regular cello. It's very, very high mm -hmm. because you, we, we, we don't have the extra E string. And it means you have to use a lot of thumb position. I don't know, I haven't got my cello yeah. to have using a thumb as a finger which was a technique not widely used uh, uh, when the, the partitas, sonatas and suites date from 1720s, roughly, don't they? Around that year. Mm. And that, well, then, yeah. well, certainly the suites do, we think, from, from that period. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know of evidence that suggests bits of them were written earlier, because I, I think I have a, a person in mind for who they might have been written at that time, you see. Mm -hmm. But the thumb uh, was not widely used in cello technique at that time. So of course you can get yeah. around it nowadays. Yeah. You, there are there are ways of playing it all on one instrument, but 
it's so hard with a with a brock cello because it's much yeah. more that way. Whereas to get for the high bits of the six suite, you want a fingerboard going more that way, which you need an end pin and slightly altered angle of the neck which is what a modern cello is brilliant at doing you, you get to fly up and down the fingerboard uh, <laughs> horizontally rather than vertically which is a bit harder yeah um so who do you think they who do you imagine they could have been written for well i haven't got direct evidence but i know that in the course at curtain was a, a fantastic violinist but he also played cello and viola de gamba because of course instrumentalists then were versatile they played more than one Cello and gamba, I suppose, related in terms of you sit down to play them both. You don't nowadays find many cellists who also play violin, not to a high standard or other way around violinists and cello. So <clears throat> this is Christian Ferdinand Arbel, who you may have heard of his son. Well, um, who, who uh, he had a, another C.F. Arbel son who uh, ended up in England later on in the second half of the 18th century. Um, connected with with another Bach in fact so there's this long-running connection between the Bach family and the Arbel family um, and we know that Christian Ferdinand rather than Carl Friedrich the son was um, this virtuoso player and that we know he was in Curtin at the same time as Bach. Um, Bach was godfather to one of Arbel's children and so they have this connection from around 1720 um, mm -hmm. Bach or the sonatas, three sonatas for viola da gamba and it's believed that they were intended for Arbel as well and then as I mentioned later on one of Bach's sons the London Bach ended up here in London um in you know from the second early second half of the 18th century again with Arbel's son and they ran a series of concerts the Bach Arbel concerts in Soho so there's a nice little family connection <laughs> I've got no documentary evidence whatsoever <clears throat> I don't believe it exists um that they were properly intended for Christian Ferdinand Arbel, but the fact that he was there and there was a connection between the families, I think is a fairly strong indication. I mean, I'd love it if somebody could come up with proof one way or the other and let me know, please do, you know, that would be fantastic. But it's, I think it's, it's important, or I feel for me, it's important to have at least an idea of a connection to a particular person who might have played it it sort of like adds an extra dimension to how we play. Yeah, it brings it to life. I mean, I think of us, I know we think quite similarly on these <clears throat> things, but we're, we're sort of time travelers and it, it's another um, weapon in our armory in a way that helps us bring, bring this to life. You know, it's not just the notes. I like to know the background. I like to know mm -hmm. the social context, the historical context, what was going on politically, how people's lives were at the time. Um, and, and that, I just, I, I will think it, it just adds, as you say, another layer to the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you, when you pick a sonata, a uh, suite, sorry. <laughs> yeah. When you pick a suite, so if it's a, if, in, if it's a new one now for you, how would you, how would you learn it? How would you approach it? So do you dig first? Do you do history first or would you just start playing and then research a bit afterwards? Or <laughs> That's a you... difficult one because I've, I have you know I, there aren't any new ones for me to, to start <laughs> although I have never performed the sixth suite I think for me it's I, I get to know the music actually and the more I know about the music the more it generates questions and I want to know certain things and I tend to then read up about the times or I look at different editions I don't know about you but I mean we probably both live with these pieces since we were teenagers mm -hmm. so they, they've always been there I mean I learned first of all, bits of the first suite, which the G major suite, which is considered to be, for cellists, the easiest one, the most technically <clears throat> simple one. Um, it's a nice friendly key anyway. And then I learned bits of the C major suite, which is tricky, but the, the bourrées are, are simpler. You know, you wouldn't want to start with a prelude where you, <clears throat> again, have to use thumb position. Uh, uh, well, so maybe I'm, I'm slightly contradicting myself there with uh, talking about thumb position in the third suite and saying it wouldn't have been widely used in the sixth suite. You need it for about three bars of the third suite. And I think mm. that that would have been acceptable. Whereas the sixth suite, you need it a lot. Um, so I nowadays, I look at different editions, actually. I, I make my own editions. I don't know if you do the same. I don't need to. I read straight from his handwriting. Huh? <laughs> and well, yeah. This is this, got, this is my music. 
and it's a uh, I cut things so that I don't have to page turn. That's my E major. That's his handwriting. Ah, okay, wow, and beautifully clear. It's very clear, actually. And um, I mean, in, in the end, you, you you don't have anybody between you yourself and the and the composer. Usually, there's an editor. If you're the editor and you're playing from it yourself, that's fine because then you can choose how long maybe a particular. Um, ambiguous slur might go um but um i really I've, i find that is it, it's nice not to have this barrier yeah. um, i find with these <clears throat> these pieces i mean i don't know I, it must be so with the the cello suites um especially when it's when it's a one line a single line like this first um e major uh, uh, first movement it's He's like, he, he's written lots and lots of parts and so it's hidden in one line and you have to mm. find the bass line and find a middle voice. And um, I know in the fugues, he's, 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 he, he writes four part fugues for yeah. the violin. And I mean, it's, un, it's comprehensible and it's musical. <laughs> so it's, I, I don't know of any other composer that can do that for, for the violin. Well, Bach has, no, I mean, Bach can certainly do that for the cello. I mean, that, that, that's the beauty of these pieces for, for cellists, and because there isn't that much solo repertoire for mm. cellists, especially of this period. Um, there's a little tiny bit beforehand, the Domenico Gabrielli. They, these are considered to be the earliest cello pieces. But the Bach, <clears throat> I mean, as cellists, we really don't have a lot if we want to play solo concerts. Mm. Um, and he's so clever at writing. It's a bass instrument, of course. But he, you hear the treble and the bass in it. You hear the real dialogue between the two different voices. I can just think of so many examples. Um, and, and it's brought out so clearly. I mean, I, I don't have, of course, as I've said, the original. I'm just leaning down to get the Anna Magdalena. We don't have the, the, the definitive. We don't have his mm. handwriting. So that, hence, a slight need to make our own additions. Because <clears throat> there are inconsistencies in the Anna Magdalena which I, I tend to use actually, but um, she wasn't or uh, the, the neatest on the handwriting, shall we say. So things, um, for example, the opening of the first G major prelude, it's, it's kind of accepted. Um, most people, it's all semi-cravers and the, the, um, you tend to slur the first three as, as one, da, da, da. Oh, sorry, I can't sing that high. Um, and then and then the fourth one is separated. But if you look at the manuscript, it's all over the place. I don't know. I don't know if you can see how, how clearly and it, it, there's even a pencil marking there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not very clear. So and that that goes through the whole of the suite. So hence the need to make additions. So what many people do, and there have been countless editions of the cello suites over the over the years from the mid, middle of the 19th century, really. Um, very different editions um so i tend and there's a fantastic publication where there, there there's nothing at all it's just the notes no slurs no anything so you can actually learn it with nothing at all and then put back and that that was actually my um i studied these with my grandfather the cellist william please and that was his preferred approach actually when i was younger start with no slurring at all and, and the music dictates the music tells mm -hmm. you what you need to do you hear the treble you hear the bass so then i tend to then I, I, I then make copies of editions and tipex out bits and add my own bits. And my own editions, you said, how did I approach learning them? They, they're sort of been a bit piecemeal over the years. Um, I've had times where I've been stricter, playing just what I think Anna Magdalena did. Mm -hmm. And then I've had times where I've wanted to play them as I learned them as a child, following my grandfather's interpretation. And his goes back to a whole different... Um, Sort of generation of cellists. He studied with Julius Klengel in Leipzig. In he was there in the early 1930s. My grandfather William um, Klengel published his own edition of the Bach Suites in 1900, and he, in fact, he he used them for teaching. They were considered to be teaching works rather than concert works. Mm -hmm. Quite late. I mean, I, I was looking at the, the statistics for it because I was really interested, um, and I was just seeing who. I've just got some notes here. Who Klengel who he took his information from. So his edition came from 1900, which is the edition my grandfather, William, learnt. 
Um, and and Klengel drew on the technique and the the studies of, of cellists such as Dotzauer and Grutzmacher. They're, these are very famous. These are names that mean something to cellists and Hugo Becker. But they're not editions Baroque cellists produce today. They're considered not historically accurate. Um, I was really fascinated. I don't know how it is with the violin repertoire, but the cello suites certainly didn't become popular until Casals started playing them. Um, the cellist um, Pablo Casals, and he'd picked up, he'd found a copy, I believe, of the Grutzmacher edition in the late 1880s in a, in a thrift shop somewhere. And he began performing these works and, and brought them into the kind of public domain as concert works rather than kind of studies. But that, that was quite late, it wasn't till, you know, certainly a couple of decades into the 20th century, because I, I looked at, I've, this ties in with other research I did about my grandfather and, and his studies. And I, a couple of years ago, um, went through the archives at the Leipzig um, Hochschule, or how do I pr how, pronounce it correctly? Hochschule. Me, I got that wrong. Hochschule. Hochschule. Uh, and I, thank you. High school. You never think I'm trying to learn German, would you? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But I looked at all the repertoire that the students played at the time, and Bach cello suites hardly make an appearance. Mm -hmm. They were used purely for teaching. They're not concert repertoire. Mm -hmm. And between, for example, I know the end of the 1920s, sort of 1925 to 1932, when Julius Klengel died around that time, only I only ever found perform the occasional performance of the first and th third suite. Nothing else at all. Wow, interesting. Yeah. That, but now you tool the internet, and there are endless yeah. recordings it's yeah. main concert repertoire isn't it for cellists yeah i think the 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 sonatas and parties oh i don't know exactly when they came back into they certainly fell out rather like the cello suites um a lot of bach fell out in most uh air, in societies so there was a um bach's music was kept alive there was i found it um last year i was researching something about um uh, actually, Danish music, and and Mendelssohn was he learned with a uh, his piano teacher. She came from the line of having learned from Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, mm -hmm. and he kept some, so. So well, there is actually an ongoing line where people kept his music alive wow. in private concerts at home, and and that's where Mendelssohn he was always for Bach's music. Mm. And 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 I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure how that continues. Maybe somebody can clarify that down in the in the comments. Um, and if Joachim was he was he the first one to come back? I know he did a lot of stuff with Mendelssohn. Uh, um, we shall do our research on yeah. that, and the next time we talk about that, then that <laughs> <laughs> I'll know what I'm talking about. There, but. The Mendelssohn, um, oh, so I'm just having a coffee at the same time. Sorry, Rachel, I yeah, can't. No, no, I'll we, have my waters. We normally have coffee together, but we're over the internet today. Yeah. So. But no, the Mendelssohn connection is very strong, of course, with Bach, because uh, Mendelssohn being in Leipzig, um, not that Bach composed the Partita Sonatas or Suites there, but he's so firmly associated with that city. You know, the last, what was he there from 1723 to 50, the, to the end of his life, uh, 27 mm. years. And it was Mendelssohn who championed his music. I mean, I was listening to some Mendelssohn yesterday, actually. His, I love the organ sonatas. And you can hear bits of Bach chorales running through some of them. It's, it's incredible. It's just there, very subtly, sort of underneath, mm -hmm. underneath it all. Um, but I don't know whether or not the Bach suites were performed in that way in, in, in private settings, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. People's houses, they might well have done. It'd be inter yeah. really interesting to know. I know that uh, that they that at least the uh, some of the movements appear in different forms. Um, one that is uh, more known is that the partita in uh, E major, um, the first movement is also in one of Bach's lute suites. Mm -hmm. So it, it starts with -lum -bum 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 -lum. so, and then the lute version it's got boom, -lum -bum -bum. it's got a first beat. <laughs> And, and, and it's also a, a movement in a cantata where it's a really big organ solo and it's got, I think, it's got trumpets and everything. I mean, it's, oh, wow. well, it's certainly big. It's got orchestra, it's got winds, and then there's this organ, big organ solo to be played on the big organ. So uh, he was reusing it. I don't know about the lute yeah. solo, but it's definitely 
um, reusing this, uh, the Partita in Leipzig. I have to say that Partita is what we say about it. It was, it's actually written Partia, <laughs> but nobody says that now, so we just call it. Is, is yeah. that a possible handwriting error, Partia? What is a Partia, or is it? It's or... just a different way of writing uh, oh. Partita. Okay. We're very, we're very strict in nowadays in finding how should be something be said. Does a slur go this far? Is it really forte there and piano there? I really, I don't think that it was as important to them as it is to us now to know exactly where things are. If it was so important to them, they would have been more accurate in where they drew their slurs. That, that's what I think about the Anna Magdalena edition. She was known for championing, championing her husband's work and being very accurate, yet she didn't make it easy to she didn't she wasn't consistent with the way she wrote out her slurs so yes maybe there was an understanding that um the onus then was on the performer the musician to to know the convention to interpret it to to know that well it's just that's what it means whereas nowadays i wonder if people like you know particularly um there can be a lot of pressure to be accurate you know to do things the right way very academically and 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 therefore you know people need to be following things to the letter um and I suppose you going back to your question about how does how did I approach learning the suites? I, I've always had a different approach because the way I perform them um, is a combination of Anna Magdalena Bach, my grandfather, and Julius Klingel. But I like the music. I like the musicality. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's me. It's me, and I put my twist into it. Yeah, it can it, only be the performer performing the music. So it, yeah, it is. Yeah, I think. We have a um, we have a duty to understand the harmony and maybe his sense behind it, but at the same time we put in our understanding. So it's like got this multiple layer. I know in in um, yeah, what I particularly like uh, in Bach's writing, and I love his fugues and I love his the first movements of the sonatas. The 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 G minor one is like uh, it's like a recitative. Mm. You've got an orchestra accompanying one voice, and then and then that changes. And in the fugue, you've got it written. Sometimes it's written for like you can imagine an organ player playing it, or you can imagine an orchestra playing it. And then and then suddenly it becomes one one person again. And it's 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 incredibly multifaceted. Um, and I think um, what what I'd I'd like more for my what I my goal is in these pieces is to bring out the bass line more because we as violinists we're like top line players you know sort of like oh <laughs> you get the tune violin, you know yeah. it's a great this you know the top line you can always be heard it's a melody and everything but actually the melody is nothing without the harmony or the bass line and 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 I think it's it's so fundamental to how Bach thought, you know, also as an organist using his feet to play these 16 foot things. And this bass line, the more it comes out, the stronger the top line is. So that's my my goal is to get a good balance and really make an audible and melodically understandable bass line in, in these yeah. pieces. That's that's my goal. I hope that comes across. <laughs> Well, it, it, yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, having having heard your interpretation, which is absolutely wonderful, it is really, really beautiful and does come across. And I think my goal is probably exactly that same, but same thing, but to bring out the melody because, of course, I'm showered with bass lines all the time. I live in the line of the bass. I live in the lands of the bass line mostly. And so the challenge as a cellist is to then you get given a melody. Wow, hey, I'm being led out of the cage for a little bit. I can play a tune. But, but, and how to handle that in conjunction with the bass line. But he makes it so easy, actually. I mean, I wonder if, I mean, we talked about, you know, you mentioned some of the movements being used in other ways. Whether or not Bach would have had intentions for it. I mean, perhaps this happened at a particular time in his life and then circumstances, this is pure conjecture, but circumstances changed. He moved to Leipzig. He was very much caught up in the world of the rhythm of life there composing cantatas but certainly <clears throat> I mean he transcribed the fifth cello suite and that was for lute as well so you've got the C minor I'm not sure if it's in the same key but you've definitely got it for lute and then you've got incidences afterwards into the 19th century of other composers sort of carrying on Bach's work so you've got <clears throat> and I'd love to find these and play these but they the manuscripts for all apart from one were destroyed Schumann 
did a version with piano. But uh, Clara, apparently, uh, Clara Schumann didn't think they were good enough. They were never published. He, Schumann, I think, also did a version of the violin sonatas or partitas with piano, which was published, I think. But uh, not for the cello. Uh, but I think there was a, a recently or within sort of recent issues, the C major suite did resurface. And that would be amazing to hear Schumann's um, spin on it. And uh, we've got um, various pianists transcribing them over the years for piano. And I don't know how you feel about other instruments um, taking your repertoire, so to speak. But I mean, the, certainly with the cello suites, they work phenomenally on, I've heard them on so many different instruments. They're absolutely, it's just such wonderful music. I think it can stand being played on anything pretty much. Oh, it certainly know. does survive the performer. Yes, yeah, yeah. Time. <laughs> yes, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> but, but there are some amazing interpretations out there. I remember when I was at music college, there was a yearly Bach competition and I duly entered it on my Baroque cello and I played the second suite. And I, I, I won it, but I shared the first prize. I, as, as I left the room, I was sort of listening to other people through the doors. Um, and they, they, they split the first prize in the end with, uh, and the, the, my co, um, what's the word, winner was uh, somebody who performed on saxophone. It was wonderful. It was stunning. Such musicality and musicianship. I think, you know, a good musician, you know, I've heard, you know, heard, heard on, all, all the sort of instruments, um, but marimba, I've heard, and my, my brother-in-law's a bass trombonist, and he regularly plays the bar suites. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. Mm. I mean, he has trouble doing the phrase, the slurs, the Anna Magdalena slurs and the prelude for the first suite. There are certain things you have to get round. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, he's regularly practices Bach. It's wonderful. Mm. But, oh, lovely. It, it's just such stunning music. I think yeah. it's, you know, and actually thinking about um, performances of it, I came across recently, I was lucky enough to be sent um, a very old concert program because I collect, I'm sort of curate the archive of all my grandparents' material. And um, a cellist um, who's related to Emmanuel Feuermann, the great Emmanuel Feuermann, um, a, a modern day cellist called Robin Furman, um, sent me a concert program from 1928 which was of a student performance um, of the London Cello School, which was run by a man called Herbert Wallen. Um, Wallen, Wallen, I'm not sure how, how you pronounce it. And it took place at Wigmore Hall. And he sent it to me because my grandpa as a 12 year old was playing in it. And he was in massed cello ensembles and they played quite a bit of, the, of Bach's first cello suite. Not individually, not in, they had, 30, 40 cellists taking part in the concert. Nobody played a solo movement, <clears throat> but they had things like the prelude done for mass cellos. Wow. I think that must have been amazing. <laughs> I yeah. wish I could travel back in time and hear that. Again, I suppose it was part of the kind of teaching repertoire at the time rather than the concert repertoire, this, you know, back in 1928. Yeah. What would you call that then? A, her a herd of cellos? <laughs> I don't know, a herd? Uh, Clumper, uh, yeah, well, gosh, yeah. Sent, sent, not clump, no, that sounds wrong. Yeah, send us some thoughts. If you come up with a collective noun, a what? Well, it, a flock. A flock of cellists. Something wood-based, maybe, yeah? Oh, right, yeah. Sorry, I don't know. I, I can only, the only thing that's a coming. A grove of cellos. A grove of cellos. <laughs> I was thinking of Parliament of Owls, because I've got my, par huh? my owl mug here. Um, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, that's a good thought, but yeah, I, those, that would have been a fascinating thing to hear, I reckon. Yeah. Seeing how they all managed to synchronise and get that in time. Sounds actually a bit scary. <laughs> potentially, potentially. <clears throat> I actually remember playing the first prelude many years ago, just as a warm up. And I was with a, a, a Thielbo playing friend of mine who just started strumming away in the background and adding the chords. And it was such a lovely sonority, actually, a beautiful texture. And I always thought, oh, I'd like to come back to that and do that again. Because, I mean, the music, certainly in the prelude, is, is basically written out chords in the form of semiquavers, so very easy thing to do. But, um, yeah, I, don't know if, I, I mean, gosh, we've talked about a lot here. Uh, um, we sort of dived around uh, lots of different areas. There's loads more, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> there's a, the, maybe, I think, um, if there are any questions, it would be, I mean, we can, we can answer them. I'm happy to answer things about the, certainly the violin pieces. Um, in the comments below, and I'm sure 
you're also happy to answer questions uh, yep, down below totally, totally. in the comments. Yeah. Well, what we'll do, we, we, um, yes, there'll be, yes, we'll, we'll regularly check back and, and ask us questions. And I do, I can't stress uh, enough, do go and listen to Rachel's recordings of the Sonatas and Partitas. You, I don't know if they're available. Um, you know what, I'll, I'll put my, I'll put my um, email address in, in the um, description and, uh, yeah, it's it's a big it's a big thing. It's it's three CDs because it's not just Bach. It's got Vestov put next to it because I believe they knew each other. And that's another whole story which is totally yeah. fascinating. And it's all in the booklet. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, that's um, it's yeah that was fun. That was a marathon doing that one. Anyway, yeah. so um, yeah, I'll put my address in the comments and uh, then you can order it for me then like that. Yeah. That would be fantastic because I, I do urge you to listen to these. Um, I've, I've been recording the first suites just at home at the moment, but um, it, there never seems to be a time when a plane isn't going over or a oh. child is opening the door and wanting something or the phone rings. So <laughs> it's not easy music to record, is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, it, eventually I'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Rachel, it's been so nice chatting to you. Oh, and, um, yeah, it's been lovely. I can't, so, can't wait for the time when we can actually be together again playing yeah, we can play rather than just talk <laughs> i know i know we're getting all talked out i kept my voice kept going hoarse i kept having to grab a quick sip of coffee uh, well, um, um, but we'll we'll look forward to, we'll see each other soon i hope and yeah, yeah do do chat do join in with the comments okay well, bye, for now. bye 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 bye